And welcome back to this special edition of Showdown. And now from one politician who has retired from battle to another politician who has retired from battle, we are joined by the former Premier of New South Wales, Christina Keneally. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Michael. And Mark Latham has some, in, 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 following on from his questions of George Brandis, he has some in-depth, powerful questions for you. Well, Christina, it's great to have you here. How are you enjoying life out of politics, uh, particularly at Basketball Australia? And I'm very, very, very interested in the publicity about the No School, No Play program. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's actually great to be out of politics. I mean, I loved being Premier of the state. I loved the opportunities that I had, but you know, at the end of the day, I also love being out. And uh, you know, with all due respect to the you know, previous half hour of this show, I think when you see some of the the, the really difficult attacks that come to people, and in my view, somewhat unjustifiably, uh, you know, it's nice to be out of that fray. Uh, but, you know, Basketball Australia, fantastic opportunity. Uh, you know, we cover the Olympic sports, we cover the NBL, the WNBL, and the grassroots. One of the things we've been doing quite successfully is using sport as a hook to get kids to go to school. So No School, No Play was funded by the Commonwealth Government. It uh, funded eight sports. Basketball was one of them. Basketball's had great results, great results in getting kids. There's a school in Coffs Harbour, went from 50% attendance rate to 91% in, one, in just in one term, from term one to term two. And we're, we're thrilled about the program. The Commonwealth Government are cutting the funding. They're cutting it, they're not continuing it. They said, oh, you know, four sport, sports didn't have success, so all eight sports, all your funding, out the window. Yeah, and this is a program that targets kids on the margins, poor kids, um, kids who don't have the opportunity to play sport, um, indigenous kids, 40% of the participants were indigenous. Yeah, and it's a real, you know, it's an incredible shame. We've made the point, at, you know, upper house here, sorry, uh, House of Representatives hearings, and we're making the point to Minister Garrett, yeah, this is something that works. It's $380,000. And as a result, 750 kids in this country, in you know, several states, are actually attending school when they weren't before. Well, so. I hope you get your funding, and that's the grassroots level, and, and, and I think basketball is a wonderful sport for young Australians, but I can remember a decade ago that the national competition, yeah. the elite level, was so much stronger than it is today. What went wrong there, and what plans have you got to bring basketball back up into a high profile in the national sporting arena. Now this is this story that there were the halcyon days of basketball and that somehow um, you know it's all been downhill since. You know, we, I want to point out some ABS statistics that came out last month. Basketball is the second highest participation sport in the country. Uh, some one million Australians play basketball. Uh, point out that our TV uh, ratings on uh, Sunday afternoon are up 73%. Uh, we're up 49% on Friday nights. Attendance has risen now three years in a row isn't on track to rise again. You know, basketball does have a couple of challenges. Uh, they're not sexy to talk about. You know, it's infrastructure, a national online registration system. It's what the AFL did and, and helped the AFL uh, leapfrog ahead. Uh, you know, there are things that we need to do ensuring that we have every basketball game available for people to watch. So we've launched NBL TV. We've been the first mover into that space of digital broadcast, every game live, every game on demand. So, you know, there are, there are really Real opportunities here. It's a great sport. Um, you know, Australia is ranked fourth in the world when it comes to basketball. And if you think about the people we we you know, compete against, uh, Russia, America, China, France, you know, we really shouldn't be in that space with our 22 million people. But we are. We're incredibly successful sport. Uh, we face one challenge that uh, AFL and NRL doesn't and that is we're a global sport. So our best players have the opportunity to play in Europe and play in America. You know, AFL has the opportunity to be a great you know, number one sport here in Australia because it's the only place in the world you can watch the sport. You know, so for us, that's both a challenge, but it's an amazing opportunity. Mm. Uh, just changing onto a, a separate issue where you've been involved recently, you've written a very powerful piece in Eureka Street about the um, uh, Catholic Church and the challenges it faces on this question of child sexual abuse. Uh, any thoughts on the Royal Commission and where you think the Catholic Church leadership should be headed on this issue? Well, I was uh, quite distressed last week by the response of the Catholic Church. It's, uh, you know, it's, I am a Catholic, lifelong Catholic. In fact, I've studied Catholic theology. And the, the response from the church last week appeared to um, project blame to the media for reporting stories of abuse. It appeared to be defensive 
about uh, these stories. It, it, and it didn't appear to do what I would have thought Jesus would have done, which is to to stand on the side of the people, of the victims, to stand on the side of the people who demand compassion and justice. Today we saw uh, effectively a new spokesperson from the Catholic Church come to the fore, Archbishop Dennis Hart from Melbourne, and I think that's a tremendous move on the part of the Catholic bishops. One, they seem to have selected someone um, who's not Cardinal Pell to speak on this issue. And two, he has spoken today with compassion. In fact, he has said that the Catholic Church should seek for um, the statute of limitations to be removed on any of these types of crimes so that victims can bring forward criminal um, complaints of criminal, alleged criminal behavior, uh, whether it's 10, 15, or 20 years later. You know, recognize that victims have been so harmed by this that it's often hard for them to bring those complaints forward. And, you know, I'm really pleased uh, that he's done that as, a, as someone who's interested in public policy, but as a Catholic, I'm really heartened. Uh, by what he's done today. There was a survey last week which showed 95% of Australians supported the calling of the Royal Commission. As a committed Catholic, do you have any sense at all that the Catholic Church are being unfairly targeted by this Royal Commission? Do, do, do you, because there's some people within the church that seem to have, have this view. Do, do you sense that at all? I can't, um, I can't endorse that view, no. No. And you know, many Catholics I talk to, uh, whether it be in my parish or friends, um, don't seem to have that view either. I think, if anything, the, the challenge for Catholics will be to come to grips with the scale of the problem. And you know, Perhaps it is naive that we haven't, in Australia, come to grips with that yet, when Ireland and America have been, have been able to, to you know, present publicly the scale of the problem. I think it'll be difficult for Catholics to cope with the idea that the church itself as an organization may be shown to have been complicit in the moving of sexual predators around the country in places where they could find new victims. And that will be a real test for Catholics to, mm. to say, how do I practice my faith in an institution that could well be shown to be so flawed? Uh, yeah, I, and if anything, that, that that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the defensiveness. Mm, sure, now, sure. Yeah, you know, just to point out, yeah, you know, what does the Bible say? You know, don't, don't, you know, don't point out the uh, the the speck, take the plank out of your mm. own eye before mm. you find the speck in your mm. in in your in someone else's. Mm. In your article, you, 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 which is headed talking to children about the Royal Commission, and your children obviously Catholics too. Without paraphrasing you, can you can you tell us what you have said to your children and how old they are, and what you have said to them about what is happening now? or what's going to happen before the Royal Commission? Well, my boys are um, early teens. One's about to become a teenager, uh, and one is. And it's, you know, on the one hand, to them, it was sort of almost, why is this even being called? You know, wh what do you mean the church would have been involved or somebody would be involved in this? And so, you know, it's hard to explain it, first of all, why a Royal Commission's been called. Um, whether it's about the Catholic Church or not. But secondly, when they, it is about the Catholic Church, where they go to school in a Catholic school, where they go to a Catholic church on the weekend, to, to try and explain in a way to say this has happened, but this is still, still a safe place with mm, values mm. that your father and I endorse. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a very difficult message to convey, particularly to, to young people. Um, the, the, and again, this is why I come back to the response of the church last week wasn't very helpful because it was hard to give a reassurance that the church himself was actually acting with compassion for victims. I, you know, I hope and I think we're seeing some change in that attitude, that public attitude. Christina, can I just ask, as the first female Premier of New South Wales, how did you view the um, recent uh, so-called misogyny debate in the federal mm. parliament and the associated issues about the future of feminism in Australia? Mm. It's something I've got a, a lot of views on and going right back to my inaugural speech in the parliament where I talked about you know, Australian feminism. I, I have a real frustration often that Australian feminism seems to be confined to the voices of highly successful women complaining about how hard it's been for them to succeed. And in my view, that does nothing for feminism. In fact, it almost disaffects working women, um, economically disadvantaged women, women of color from feminism. Uh, and, you know, I can only 
point to a great example of this. You know, at the, I've said ironically, but it's not. There's half a truth in it that um, Mike Carlton is my current famous f favorite Australian feminist. You know, he was asked on Q and A about women on boards. He said, "I'm less interested on women on boards. I'm more interested on women on the factory floor and their rights." And I, I think he's on to something there. Uh, yeah, that is the point we often miss. You know, in Australian um, feminism, you know, we're amongst the most advantaged women in the world. You know, economically advantaged, um, academically advantaged. So. Um, but can I say this? I thought the Prime Minister's speech was spot on because she wasn't whinging or complaining. She was fighting back. She was fighting back against something that was unjustified. And I think people respond well to a fighter. Christina, we were going so well there for a while. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Christina, we wanted to thank you very much indeed for coming all the way out here tonight and sharing those comments with us, particularly your very heartfelt comments about the Royal Commission. So thank, thank you. you very much indeed on behalf of Mark and I. We'll take a break. We'll be back after this.